Up next, we have Norman from Dresden who will tell us about his latest work. Thank you and uh, welcome back everyone. Thanks for coming to this session immediately after lunch. I'd like to tell you a little bit about Tile. That's how I pronounce that. Tensor Intermediate Language with Tile for short. Um, the point is on, uh, on the point about Tile is a uh, type safety property. So this talk will be perhaps a little bit on the formal slide, although I'll try to go by example as much as possible. Um, so we've already heard about uh, tensors today and tensor languages, and uh, I'm pretty sure everyone is aware that in recent years we've kind of like seen a real inflation of tensor frameworks coming out. Uh, the ones that I've, uh, that I've put in the uh, top right corner of the uh, slide are kind of like chosen more or less at random, not entirely at random. Some of them feature in the in the paper in a certain uh, way as examples. But again, this is just a selection, and I apologize if your favorite framework is not on this, on this slide. Um, I'm a bit disappointed that I'm not the first person to, uh, to kind of like state this, this rough equality here. Or, already our keynote speaker this morning, uh, or I think it was actually the, 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 the chair in, in this introduction, like said that, uh, well, nowadays you call them uh, tensors and not arrays anymore, um, for reasons that I fully understand, but I'm guessing tensor is the more, uh, the more uh, fashionable term these days. And um, so a tensor language it is really just an array language, I suppose, and each of these frameworks here and the frameworks also that are not listed here typically come with their own uh, tensor language for expressing uh, tensor kernels. And one of the things that this community obviously has a lot of experience with is uh, uh, array languages, which we should nowadays call tensor languages, and I will uh, do that uh, for the rest of the talk. And um, in particular, there's a class of functional array languages that have been studied in part also by this community. And like functional languages in general, they enjoy uh, certain type safety properties that have been formally developed. And what I mean by, by, by type safety in the context of this talk is that a well-typed program should not have out-of-bounds accesses. Now, of course, you can ensure that in different ways. I mean, if you uh, put dynamic checks everywhere, then uh, you can basically check at runtime that there are no out-of-bounds accesses. But what we're after here is some kind of like static uh, type safety or static memory safety in the sense that um, if a program passes the type checker, then there shouldn't be any need for dynamic bounds checking. So, a lot of this work, this formal work on type safety has been done in the context of functional languages and functional array languages as well. However, the, um, the languages we see uh, in, uh, in, in these recent frameworks, they are essentially imperative. So I was wondering, and we were wondering when we sort of like started this project, uh, what is there to be said about type safety, um, or what is there to be proven by way of type safety about imperative languages? And of course, before you can like prove any property, so like formally, um, you need a formal specification of your language. And I mean, the need for specification was already pointed out earlier today, uh, perhaps in a slightly different context. But if I want to stand any chance of giving a sort of like a formal guarantee um, of uh, type safety or memory safety, then I need a formal specification of uh, the language I'm talking about. And the languages in these recent frameworks uh, do not usually come with uh, formal specifications. So, and this is why we propose Tile. Uh, so it's a imperative tensor intermediate language. Well, now you might say, well, yet another intermediate language, yet another ten tensor language. Uh, if we've learned anything today so far, it's that we shouldn't be um, introducing more, more languages or more frameworks at random. Um, maybe, maybe that was not the message that <laughs> we're supposed to uh, take away. But um, our point with Tile is that it's supposed to serve as some kind of common de denominator for reasoning about these uh, imperative tensor languages. And I'll have a motivating example in a minute uh, why that might be useful or uh, indeed uh, important. And um, so and we propose Tile so that we can uh, uh, develop for it a formal specification. Uh, and we have formalized that within the uh, Cog Theorem Prover. Uh, where we also develop the relevant type safety result. 
And the relevant result is that in well-typed tile programs, there are no out-of-bounds accesses, um, which might seem mundane and like kind of like a type one or subject, but again, I'll, I'll bring up an example in a minute for why I think that is still relevant. Um, and of course, if you, in your language, allow arbitrary um, expressions to index into tensors explicitly, then you stand no chance of giving this guarantee statically. Right? So you have to somewhat reduce the, uh, the, the way, reduce the ways in which you can index, and we achieve that by um, uh, allowing so-called collective operations, uh, which may be otherwise known as combinators only, to form tensor expressions, uh, which I think suffices to express uh, a lot of interesting kernels. Um, yeah, and so the, uh, the context for tile then is basically the right column here in these frameworks and other frameworks that are perhaps not listed. Um, you typically express tensor kernels in, um, in their language, and we do not propose that you should use tile as a code generator um, because simply we, uh, uh, we, we, we cannot address all the, uh, or cannot target all the platforms that are targeted by the existing frameworks, but you might find Tile useful for uh, type checking, for obtaining static guarantees, if you can translate or re-express your tensor kernels in Tile. Of course, you could automate that. Um, we do, however, have implemented uh, Tile uh, with a code generator. We have implemented a code generator that produces low-level C code from, uh, from Tile, and we use that in a project where we uh, generate a uh, low-level code from an operator <coughs> language in the, um, that is used to exp express uh, kernels that are relevant in the domain of fluid dynamics. I'll, I'll say a few more things about that. So after that, sort of like general introduction, I'll move on to a motivating example. Uh, then I'll present Tile and our type safety result, and I'll have one final slide on uh, future or indeed ongoing work. So on to the example that I've been promising. So we've, uh, the paper has a few more examples, but I think the most educational one and the most useful one for this talk is the one that pertains to TVM. Uh, TVM is for Tensor Virtual Machine, and there's a fairly recent uh, publication on it, which includes this kernel. Uh, so this kernel performs what you might want to call transpose matrix multiplication. You declare matrices A and B, or tensors as we should call them now, uh, with uh, dimensions MH and NH, they're highlighted here uh, in, uh, in bold font because um, uh, they're going to be relevant in a second. And the uh, transpose matrix, uh, the, the transpose matrix product is basically computed here, where you reduce uh, over an axis K that is declared uh, with a range from zero to H. And the astute reader may have already noticed at this point that. 8k is used to index into the first dimension of A and B, which have ex are declared with extents M and N, and not H, and there's no obvious relationship between uh, M, N, and H. Uh, so in sort of like more abstract mathematical formula, what's computed here is this. Um, however, because of uh, the way that's indexed into, uh, that, that, that k is used to index into A and B, um, you will likely end up with a segmentation fault if uh, the extent H is large enough compared to M and H. If it's not, then you might uh, basically just compute nonsense or you get silent data corruption because you're accessing uh, memory that's beyond uh, the extents of A and B, but not far enough outside of uh, uh, your allocated memory or the application's allocated memory to call the segmentation fault. So, and the fix is, or the fix might be, uh, swapping the dimensions in the declarations of A and B, as I've done on the right. Um, of course, that's really only fixed if that kernel is, that computation is actually what the user had in mind. Uh, still computes the same, uh, the same uh, expression, like conceptually, and uh, there is no, uh, no out-of-bounds access here. So, the reason I'm, 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 I'm walking this example is that there is, actually, there is, there is a reason I walked this example, and the reason is that there's no reason for there to be uh, kind of a, uh, a problem with the kernel on the left. All the information is there to do like the static type checking and to highlight that there's a problem. Um, and indeed, I'm not trying to nitpick here, TVM is generally actually quite good at this. So when you launch a kernel, it'll check that the, uh, the uh, tensors you pass in uh, are of uh, dimensions that are compatible with the declarations of the placeholders in the kernel. 
but it doesn't seem to check for this, uh, for this problem. And that's what we want to avoid in tile. Um, and as I've already said, uh, we only stand a chance of giving a static uh, a guarantee about out of bounds access or the absence thereof if we limit the, uh, uh, the, exp the expressions that we're allowed or if we limit the, the ways we're allowed to index into tensors. So, a quick overview tile kernels are very simple, or programs as they're called here. They're a sequence of allocations and statements. Allocations introduce identifiers as uh, so like tensor variables and declare them with uh, a certain shape, or for the purpose of this talk, I'll refer to the shape as a type. That's basically um, a list of, uh, of integers, a list of the extents of the dimensions. Um, and I, I use the term shape and type interchangeably here because we're not looking at different kind of base types. So we consider that all array entries are the same base type, typically for some kind of a floating point type. Adding this, adding integers, adding other types is not really uh, conceptually very difficult, uh, but it, we also don't learn much by, by, by adding this at this stage. Um, and then statements are assignments of uh, potentially complex expressions to identifiers, and the expressions that we allow are the ones that are listed sort of like in the bottom half of that, uh, of that box. So we have element-wise addition, multiplication, uh, obviously also uh, uh, reductions, which are important, and uh, uh, transpositions and some other more, uh, more kind of like exotic looking operations that I'll come on to. Um, so with allocations, we declare variables and we assume then that uh, memory has been uh, allocated for them. And we take a relatively abstract view at memory, model memory as a map from identifiers to tensors. And tensors themselves we think of as maps from some kind of index list to the relevant domain of this course, which again is typically the domain of floating point numbers. And this relatively abstract view means that when we update memory, kind of like the most atomic update we could do is we can pick a specific variable y and an index set kappa. And we can, uh, when we update memory, we basically produce a new function, mu prime, uh, out of the original memory view. That's uh, not going to be too relevant for uh, the rest of the the rest of the presentation uh, today, but it is of course relevant for our uh, development uh, of, uh, of type safety. And I'll say a bit more about the, uh, this uh, kind of, uh, about what you might be able to do with this kind of abstract choice uh, of memory. Um, okay, so <clears throat> then if we're talking about type safety, we, we want to sort of like define how we type expressions. And we do that in a context that basically assigns types, aka shapes, to uh, tensor variables. And then typing of expressions is relatively straightforward. So you have a rule for typing uh, variables that just look up the type in the, uh, in the context. And then, kind of like the most straightforward rule, an instance of which I think we've already seen in the context of a different talk, is the one for element-wise addition. You can add to, uh, to tensor expressions E0 and E1 uh, only if they have the same type yota prime, and the result is again of type yota prime. Um, product means the outer, ten the outer product, or also known as a tensor product, where basically the type of the expressions is just, uh, uh, it's just concatenated. That's what we use the, uh, the hash for. Um, and then the typing for some of the more complex expressions actually gives you a good feel of what these expressions do. So reduction, obviously, to a reduction along a dimension, along the ith dimension. This is why the, uh, the uh, entry ni disappears from uh, the type of e when you apply a reduction to e, and then transposition swaps dimension, and so forth. And diagonal, I'll, uh, I'll come on to an example on the next slide. So that's the typing. Um, and then you have to define the evaluation of expressions. Uh, we uh, use this kind of like standard notation of this double bracket or semantic bracket that basically turns an expression into a function. And this function basically evaluates a tensor in the context, the context of being the typing context and the, uh, the memory. And rather than go through the, uh, the formal definitions, uh, which are of course in the paper, but are perhaps not the, the lightest read, uh, let's look at a, a, sort of like a well-known simple example, the example of matrix multiplication. Okay, so in mathematical formula, you would, you, you would write matrix multiplication as, as shown here. And then in tile, you would, you would 
express this as the uh, kernel in the, in the bottom half of this box. So you have three allocations for tensors A, B, and C. So then Tile knows, well, these are, there's sort of like memory available for these somewhere. Uh, they're declared with uh, the kind of the right types here, the right extent uh, of their dimensions. And then the expression for matrix multiplication perhaps looks a little bit convoluted. So let me walk through this kind of like going from inside out. Um, so you first take the outer product of A and B, A and B being matrices, they both conceptually carry two indices each. The outer product then uh, carries four independent indices. And what you use this diagonal operation for is uh, to essentially identify the indices at positions two and three. So then you end up with uh, an expression AB that carries three indices, uh, just as here in the kind of abstract notation. And the last thing you need to do is you need to reduce over the common index, which is the index at position two. And using the definition of expression evaluation, again, that's given in detail in the paper, um, you can sort of like check that this is the expression here at the bottom does the right thing. You, um, you now sort of like read this, this expression inside the double brackets from outside in, and reduction first introduces uh, this uh, summation and the index k in this index list at the far right. Um, then the diagonal again duplicates this index, or if you read this from, uh, from bottom up, then it identifies the indices at, at positions two and three. Um, the product kind of distributes this index list across A and B, and finally you just look up A and B in the store. Okay? Right, so that's kind of like expression evaluation uh, in a in a, in, a, in a whirlwind, just um, looking at one example. Um, of course, then there's program evaluation, which is mostly straightforward. Uh, so programs are essentially sequences of statements. Evaluation of sequence of statements is uh, basically captured by these two rules. And then full program evaluation takes place in a memory mu allocs that is compatible with the allocations in the program. And similarly, there's a concept of a static context gamma allocs that's compatible with uh, the allocations also. Right. And um, just one note, I, just, I noticed when I was putting these slides together, and obviously I used the same LaTeX code to compile this, uh, this slide as, a, as a use for the paper, um, and I only noticed after the fact that there's a, there's a typo here. This, this prime should be, and the typo is also in the paper. And that's a prime, I left that in here on purpose because that's a prime example for why you want to develop these things in a proof system like COP, because then, you know, if you have these kind of mistakes in your little formula, chances are you won't be able to derive the results that you're, that you're after. Or the rule checker won't let you, uh, won't let those pass. Okay, and lastly, what I haven't shown you is the rule for evaluating statements. That looks a little bit uh, uh, convoluted. It has like these complex uh, premises, uh, which I'll come on to saying only a little bit about in a second. So that is program evaluation. And then on the static side of things, you then have program typing. Uh, again, statements are typed relatively straightforwardly. You just have to make sure the uh, types of the expression on the, on the right matches the type of the, uh, the variable you're assigning to. And then typing sequences of statements and typing full programs is uh, straightforward. And ultimately, uh, what type safety uh, means, it, or what type safety is, it expresses a relationship between these two judgments uh, that are in, uh, highlighted uh, by these green boxes. So type safety says that if a uh, program is well typed, that's uh, captured by the box on the right, then it can uh, be fully evaluated, which is captured by the box on the left. Now I kept using the terms type safety and memory safety more or less interchangeably, and I kept promising that um, if a program is type safe, then there are no out of bounds accesses. Now how is this captured by this? Well, it's actually captured by this by the premises, uh, to be precise, of this statement rule, because this rule basically only allows a program, program evaluation to make progress if there are no out-of-bounds accesses. That's kind of like baked into the, uh, mostly the premises, but also the conclusion of this, of this rule. Okay, so again, you don't need to, you don't need to sort of like try to parse all the, uh, the, the, the rules in here, the kind of like the things that are highlighted uh, are sort of like the important, the important parts. Um, right, 
and then we come on to sort of like formalizing this in, uh, uh, in uh, formalizing this and then deriving a, a formal proof of type safety within uh, the COG. And to this end, we model uh, dimensions and um, uh, index lists as lists of natural, natural numbers, which means we need a couple of straightforward results about them, some of which are kind of like provided by, 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 by the COGS library, some of which we have to, uh, we have to uh, sort of like prove ourselves. And um, it turns out the formal reasoning simplifies if we restrict the ways in which we let uh, expressions manipulate the shapes of, uh, of tensors. Specifically, uh, transpositions are now only allowed between immediately adjacent dimensions. Uh, and analogous restrictions apply to reductions and the diagonal and other operations as well. Um, and with this restriction, we um, like replacing transposition, reduction, and so on and so forth with uh, expressions that are restricted in this way, uh, we arrive at what we call quartile, um, like, kind of like the core part of the language. And it may not be as expressive as tile because you now have to uh, you now have to sort of like work a bit harder to get general transpositions. Um, but this is no uh, restricting to uh, adjacent transpositions only is presents no loss of generality by a standard result of group theory. Uh, again, of course, if you were to write your translated tile program into a quartile program, you might end up writing a lot of uh, transpositions that you uh, don't necessarily want or need. Um, but quite frankly, you shouldn't be writing this manually anyway. So right? you probably don't want to write tile manually either. I mean, there's a reason we call it intermediate language that you want it to be, to, to be generated. Okay, so, and again, with, uh, with uh, kind of like a couple of uh, straight, more or less straightforward results about, about lists and list operations, uh, we can then move on to the, uh, 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 the, the results of interest. And I'm now kind of like going in reverse order. I'm starting with the main result, and then I'll present a few uh, ingredients that you, you, you need to develop first before uh, you, can, you can establish this, uh, this main type safety result. So basically, what this says is that if you have a well-typed program, then there exists a memory new prime such that you can evaluate the program to this new memory new prime. I mean, again, tal, tal is an imperative language, so what do programs do? Well, programs change state, and state specifically means a, a state of memory, uh, so the evaluation of a full program is captured entirely by what it does to memory, uh, and here again, a well-typed program transforms uh, the memory mu allocs that's compatible with the applications to a memory mu prime, which is not further specified here, except that mu prime is equivalent to mu allocs in a sense. And what do I mean by equivalence? Uh, equivalence here means that uh, the memories have the same domains. Okay. For the purpose of type safety, it's not actually relevant what values reside in the memory. It's not actually relevant what values the program co computes. All that's relevant is uh, that memories have kind of like the same domains uh, because that affects statements about um, out of bounds access, of course. And so this uh, type safety theorem is basically a consequence of type safety for individual statements, and then you prove uh, you prove type safety uh, for programs basically by an induction over the length of the statements in the in the program and the type safety for statements is captured by this lemma. Um, and again, uh, the absence of out-of-bounds access is kind of implicit in this rule. So if we can evaluate, uh, if we can evaluate the statement x equals e uh, to a new memory new prime, um, then by the premises of this rule for statement evaluation that I showed you two slides back, um, uh, you can't have out-of-bounds accesses in terms of the formal development, you can't have accesses to the map mu that, uh, uh, that lead to undefined values. Okay, so um, this, to obtain this lemma, you actually need to work a little bit harder. You, need to, you basically need a lemma about well-definedness of expressions. And what does that mean? Well-definedness of expressions, it basically means that um, there are no out-of-bounds accesses for reads. Right, so expressions, amongst other things, can just be variable names, and if, in the context of the formal variable, uh, sorry, if in the context of the formal development, uh, variable.
variables are well defined. Uh, that means that um, when these variables are accessed at indices kappa here, um, there are no out of bounds accesses. Um, and this lemma is essentially proven by induction over E, or at least that was the original proof. While I was preparing these slides, it's obvious I, I, I noticed that it's a little bit easier, or the, proof is, the structure of the proof becomes a little more readable if instead of doing induction on E, you do induction on this, um, this typing judgment or the derivation of this typing judgment. Um, but the kind of like the hard work, pretty much the hard work stays the same. The structure of the proof becomes a bit more readable than the hard work. And again, all of this we formalized uh, within, uh, within COC and the, uh, the formal developments available from my, my GitHub page. The links, uh, this link and another link that will come up on the next slide uh, are obviously in the paper. Um, I realize there isn't enough time to write this down now if you, if you, if you want it. Um, Okay, and that basically concludes uh, the presentation of our sort of like uh, formal development and formal specification of Tile and Core Tile. And I want to take a few moments to uh, talk about uh, ongoing and future work. Um, so I'm coming back to this diagram because our main application for Tile is in the context of a operator language uh, that is uh, used in the CFD domain, CFD is for, comput CFD is for computational fluid dynamics. Again, uh, implementation sources are available uh, on GitHub. Um, and we use Tile, obviously, as an intermediate language, because that's what, what it is. Um, and so we generate, we generate Tile from this operator language, which is uh, sort of like embedded in C++. Um, and then from Tile, we generate, uh, generate low-level C code. And, in this process, it's obviously helpful that uh, that Tile is a type to intermediate language, and we also uh, use some equational some equational reasoning to uh, to, to validate to ourselves the uh, transformations we do um, within the Tile backend, or at the level of Tile, I should say. Um, so that's an existing uh, application uh, that we kind of like also mentioned in the in the paper because we didn't just want to. I mean, one of the main purposes of Tile is, as I said, it starts to be like a common denominator for existing tensor languages, and we want it to, uh, we want it to be used to, 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 reason, um, to reason about uh, tensor kernels and their correctness. Um, but of course, we didn't just want, want it to be some kind of like formal exercise. We wanted to prove that you can actually implement it and use it, uh, well, use it in a useful way. One thing that we're open about and we've got to be is that we cannot currently express stencils in Tile because we don't have the right primitives in the in the language. Uh, I'm confident though that we can express, uh, sorry, that we can extend Tile in a way that is analogous to how Lyft has relatively recently been extended. Um, Lyft also started out without uh, without stencils and, and they were now added um, uh, leading up to, to a CGO last year where a presentation of, of, of uh, stencils and lift was given. Um, so I promised I was going to say a, a few more things about this sort of like abstract uh, view on memory that we've taken uh, in the formal development of Tile. Um, one thing we would um, we would want to we would want to do is see if we can sort of like instantiate that with more con concrete uh, memory models and that might help overcome some uh, some issues with performance portability that were highlighted here last year. And um, finally, what is also a work in progress, uh, some work that we're actually currently involved in, is uh, using Tile to reason about parallel execution and uh, absence of data races. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much.
could do this via rules, or you could just um, kind of like use a so like a very you could replace the function that we currently have that holds memory with like something that resembles physical memory more closely, like a list, for example, or some kind of list or whatever. Where in a dense layout, you would obviously populate every entry in the list, and then you would like go through it sequentially. And for uh, sparse tensors, you would obviously have to like uh, to like look up items in the list to, to like less way to work. Except, except the formalization in Coq. I mean, can you can you highlight maybe a bit of the differences between, say, Lift approach and, and this thing, or any any array language with some form of weak dependent types that allow you to track the uh, dimensional. So here we don't. We don't even have to use dependent types. Yeah, yeah, yeah I right? understand. Um, have and no and, and there's, a, there's a reason for that, which is to do with the implementation. Yeah. Um, if you want to reason about um, so like weakly dependent types. But seemingly uh, Lyft can do exactly the same yeah. module of this, this COC uh, formalization part. Do you have anything else that, that distinguishes your work or, or, or just do the. Um, I, 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 I don't want to be so bold as to promise that we have anything that goes right. beyond Lyft. I mean, I don't know the project in too much detail, um, but uh, of course it would be nice if we could carry some of this over to, to oh. Lyft or some other language that is perhaps uh, perceived to be in more use. Is the process of transforming the, ker the tensor from kernel into the uh, higher language automated, <coughs> or is there any specific challenge in automating this process? Um, so it's not automated for general tensor languages, of course. Um, I mean, for us it works well because I mean, we kind of, obviously, for our operator language, we obviously kind of like knew what we needed and what we wanted, so that is relatively straightforward. Uh, in general, we basically give you no tools for automating that process, and for arbitrary kernels, that process is likely to not succeed actually. Because you may not, I mean, as you may have noticed, I mean, Tal is relatively limited in his, his expressiveness purpose because then he can do all the reasoning and get all the guarantees. Um, so you may not be able to translate, uh, to translate kernels <coughs> even with some automated process. I mean, as I said on the last slide, I mean, we're quite frank about not having stencils at the moment. So if you have any kernel that is a stencil kernel, you, know, you stand no chance of succeeding at translating. 